Justin Trudeau's government has supported uh, the state of Israel in every conceivable way from the time it was first elected. They've done this by deepening our trade relations with Israel, conferring uh, benefits, trade benefits on the illegal Israeli settlements in the West Bank, uh, trading in weapons with Israel, voting against uh, widely supported resolutions at the United Nations that condemned Israel's crimes. Um, I mean, you name it, there's hardly any way, uh, I can't think of a single way in which they haven't supported the state of Israel. And throughout this entire period, uh, as has been well documented by multiple human rights organizations, Israel has been committing the crime of apartheid, and now it's committing the crime of genocide. You have two audiences, basically. There are the people out there in the public uh, who don't know quite what to make of all of this. Of course, some people are very pro-Israel and we're not going to change their minds, no matter what we say or do. Then there's another segment of the population that doesn't need to be persuaded. Uh, you know, and they may or may not join us in the protest, but they've already come uh, you know, to a conclusion based upon the facts. But there's a large swath of the population that doesn't really know. They may lean one way or another, but they don't have a strong view and they are cognizant of the fact that they don't, they don't know a great deal about the history of this entire uh, so-called conflict. Uh, those, that's the audience that we're primarily interested in. When you go out in public, you know, you saw when you were there today, Boulevard René Levesque, uh, at 9 a.m., there's a lot of traffic. People will see us out there. They'll hear us making noise, waving the Palestine flag. They'll go, hmm. And they see that often enough, they start asking themselves questions. Why are all these people out in the streets? What are they upset about? Why do they say these things? So we try to stimulate conversation and uh, inquiry by the members of the public who, whose minds aren't made up. Uh, and the other audience, of course, is the political class, the people who are in the building today. We want, it, we want them to feel the heat. We want them to feel that whenever they appear anywhere publicly, whenever they, their, their presence is known to the public, they are going to have to confront protests. We really felt we have no alternative but to constantly uh, protest uh, and uh, particularly when we can get anywhere close to the members of the Trudeau cabinet to make them feel that pressure personally. In human equality, if we believe in the sanctity of human life, uh, then we should care about any people being subjected to apartheid and genocide, whoever they may be. Uh, if we aren't prepared to, you know, come to their defense, then let's just face up to what we really are. Uh, we're a society that only, selfish society, a selfish country, only cares about itself. Uh, and, uh, you know, human rights be damned. Uh, 
I think that's not what we should aspire to be. Uh, and I believe that most Canadians don't want that for this country either. Uh, so that's the first thing, whatever uh, our role may or may not be in the suffering of Palestinians. Uh, if you believe in human equality, this is something that should should preoccupy you to some degree. Uh, secondly, we are actually complicit in their suffering. We are not innocent bystanders. And thirdly, this will, even if you're looking at this purely from a selfish perspective, so you don't care about people outside of the country, outside of your own community. Uh, you don't care about non-Canadians, you know, all you care about is uh, your own quality of life. Well, this is going to come back to haunt us. Israel did precisely, precisely what you know anybody could have predicted. It thumbed its nose at the General Assembly. And if you're not prepared to back up that vote with concrete action, then it's pointless. Uh, and what are the concrete actions? Sanctions. Sanctions. Exactly what they've done to Russia, what they've done to Iran, what they did to Venezuela, even though, uh, frankly, none of these countries, none of these countries has engaged in the level of depravity and monstrosity that we're witnessing today in Gaza. So just take, let's take the example of uh, uh, the Ukraine war. Uh, in some two years, it's been almost two years, less than 600 children have been killed. Not all of them were killed by Russian forces, by the way, because the Ukrainians also fired a huge amount of munitions, and some of those munitions uh, did kill civilians. Uh, but let's suppose that all of the, civilian, uh, the, the, the children deaths are attributable to Russia. That's fewer than 600 in two years. Over 12,000 have been killed by Israel in Gaza in three months. That's the, the rate at which... Uh, they are killing children in Gaza is, I did the math, it's about 133 times greater than the rate at which children are dying in the Ukraine war. And yet we have not imposed a single sanction on Israel, but have imposed a broad array of sanctions on Russia. We've sanctioned virtually everything we can sanction when it comes to Russia. So what's the point of voting if you're not going to back it up when Israel thumbs your no its, its nose at you? You know, it has to, we have to enforce the law. Uh, and sanctions are the best way to go about that. So could you tell me why protesters were gathered outside of uh, the Fairmont um, earlier today? Because uh, Justin Trudeau's government has supported uh, the state of Israel in every conceivable way from the time it was first elected. They've done this by deepening our trade relations with Israel, conferring uh, benefits, trade benefits on the illegal Israeli settlements in the West Bank. Uh, trading in weapons with Israel, voting against uh, widely supported resolutions at the United Nations that condemned Israel's crimes. Um, I mean, you name it, there's hardly any way, uh, I, I can't think of a single way in which they haven't supported the state of Israel. And throughout this entire period, uh, as has been well documented by multiple human rights organizations, Israel has been committing the crime of apartheid, and now it's committing the crime of genocide. And the Trudeau government still has not changed this policy, still has not imposed a single sanction on Israel, even though it's done that with respect to numerous other uh, human rights violators. So we really felt we have no alternative but to constantly uh, protest, uh, and uh, particularly when we can get anywhere close to the members of the Trudeau cabinet to make them feel that pressure personally. Um, have you been face to face with any of these politicians, you know, during these last um, few months? Yes, uh, I have personally. Uh, 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 now I'm going to use the word confront, but it was all 
done peacefully and lawfully. I confronted Trudeau uh, uh, in Montreal. I confronted the Environment Minister Stephen Gilbeau, uh, the Refugees Minister Mark Miller, uh, Melanie Jolie. I actually uh, disrupted an event uh, where she was hosting Antony Blinken. Uh, I disrupted another event involving Melanie Jolie and the uh, Foreign Minister of Germany, Annalena Baerbach, which was here in Montreal. Um, I have uh, disrupted uh, Anthony Housefather, uh, a Liberal MP who is the uh, chair of the Canada-Israel Parliamentary Friendship Group. Um, and those are the ones I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, so yeah, I've had plenty of opportunities. Um, also the CEO of the CBC, Catherine Tate. Um, and uh, in every case, what happens is I'm you know, afforded somewhere between 30 and 60 seconds to say what I have to say. And within seconds of me beginning to speak, uh, you know, security personnel, usually RCMP officials, sometimes Montreal police officers will lay their hands upon me without my consent, with no lawful justification and drag me out. That's what happens every time. And I never get a, a straight answer. Never. There, there's never been any case where one of these politicians has, or the person from the CBC has taken the time to speak with you. It's, it's all the same every time. It, the only time where there was, I, I didn't get answers to my questions. What I got was evasion. But the only time I got a response of some kind where the person actually spoke to me was Mark Miller. Uh, that was about a month ago. And the only reason why uh, he actually spoke, uh, you know, to me was because it was a very small setting. Uh, it was a, a small press conference he was, he was holding and there were no security personnel there to drag me out. So I just sat there that, you know, he had to, he had to deal with me and I kept talking to him and I, he kept talking to me, but he never answered my question. My, my basic question was in light of everything that Israel is doing. And by the way, the, is the, the Canadian government itself has, acknowledged on the Global Affairs Canada website that the settlements in the West Bank, Israel settlements, are a violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention, as was held by the International Court, Court of Justice unanimously 20 years ago. Uh, so it's not like they haven't, uh, they, they deny the illegality of what Israel's doing. They acknowledge it. And I just said to him, why haven't you posed any sanctions? One sanction. And so he said, what sanctions should we impose? He just kept asking me questions. So I listed one. He said, what other ones? So finally, I got through four and he kept going. I said, look, I've given you four examples. I'm not going to continue to answer your questions. I'm asking you to answer my question. Why won't you put impose any sanctions? I've given you four types of sanctions you could impose. And at that point, he just walked away from the microphone. That's the only uh, response of any kind that I've gotten from any of these politicians uh, when, I've, uh, when I've confronted them with hard questions about Israel. Um Disruptive protests, you know, such as the one you've been taking part in over the last few months and including today, why are they such an important form of protesting uh, during the war in Gaza? Well, you have two audiences, basically. There are the people out there in the public uh, who don't know quite what to make of all of this. Of course, some people are very pro-Israel and we're not going to change their minds no matter what we say or do. Then there's another segment of the population that doesn't need to be persuaded, uh, you know, and they may or may not join us in the protest, but they've already come, uh, you know, to a conclusion based upon the facts. But there's a large swath of the population that doesn't really know. They may lean one way or another, but they don't have a strong view and they are cognizant of the fact that they don't, they don't know a great deal about the history of this entire uh, so-called conflict. Uh, those that's the audience that we're primarily interested in when you go out in public you know you saw when you were there today boulevard and uh at 9 a.m there's a lot of traffic people will see us out there they'll hear us making noise waving the palestine flag they go home and they see that often enough they start asking themselves questions why are all these people out in the streets what are they upset about why do they say these things so we try to stimulate conversation and uh, inquiry by the members of the public who whose minds aren't made up uh, and the other audience, of course, is the political class, the people who are in the building today. We want, it, we want them to feel the heat. We want them to feel that whenever they appear anywhere publicly, whenever they, their, their presence is known to the public, they are going to have to confront protests. And I've said before, and I, I, I was gratified to see that somebody actually did this recently, we should actually take this to the doorsteps of their homes. Uh, you know, uh, not, not 
in anything other than a peaceful manner, and we shouldn't be uh, unduly disruptive, but there were a number of people who peacefully protested at the home of Melanie Jolie, uh, the foreign minister last week. Uh, that's the kind of pressure we need so that they can't escape it. Every time you know they show their faces, even when they're at home, uh, there are people out there calling them out for supporting a genocidal regime, which is exactly what they're doing. What would you say to people who are saying, you know, we don't have anything, just civilians, we don't have anything to do with this war in Gaza. Why, you know, why are you disrupting everyday life and things like this? Well, uh, if we believe in human equality, if we believe in the sanctity of human life, uh, then we should care about any people being subjected to apartheid and genocide, whoever they may be. Uh, if we aren't prepared to, you know, come to their defense, then let's just face up to what we really are. Uh, we're a society that only, selfish society, a selfish country, only cares about itself. Uh, and, uh, you know, human rights be damned. Uh, I think that's not what we should aspire to be. Uh, and I believe that most Canadians don't want that for this country either. Uh, so that's the first thing, whatever uh, our role may or may not be in the suffering of Palestinians. Uh, if you believe in human equality, this is something that should should preoccupy you to some degree. Uh, secondly, we are actually complicit in their suffering. We are not innocent bystanders for all the reasons I mentioned about how our government is supporting them. And thirdly, this will, even if you're looking at this purely from a selfish perspective, so you don't care about people outside of the country, outside of your own community. Uh, you don't care about non-Canadians. You know, all you care about is uh, your own quality of life. Well, this is going to come back to haunt us, uh, and it already is, as a matter of fact. Uh, so what I'm talking about here particularly is the uh, Yemeni Ansarallah, Ansala, Ansala, which uh, you know we refer to as the Houthis. Uh, they have effectively stopped traffic, uh, commercial uh, shipping in the Red Sea. It's very clear why they're doing that, because of the genocide happening in Gaza. Uh, they said they'll allow it to be restored once that is stopped. Uh, and I saw an article in the CBC a week ago uh, talking about how Canada's commercial shippers are being adversely impacted by the inability to ship through the Red Sea. And this is going to increase shipping costs. Uh, this is going to uh, increase the cost of goods uh, that we are importing into Canada from markets in that area of the world. Uh, it's going to increase the cost of our goods to the extent we have to ship them around the, you know, the Cape of Africa rather than through the uh, Suez Canal. Um, so this, and then and, and that's just the, the beginning. Uh, if this uh, uh, breaks out into a full-scale war, and it, we're perilously close to that right now, uh, then the price of oil is going to go through the roof. It's going to reach historically high levels. We're already struggling with inflation in this country. And then there's, of course, radicalization. You know, people see us supporting a genocidal regime in that part of the world. You know, we've seen this before. The intelligence agencies refer to it as blowback, where uh, the, sub the population is being subjected to brutalization with our support, uh, ends up lashing out uh, at our own population, sometimes in atrocious ways, as we saw with, uh, with in, in, for example, in the attacks, the 9-11 attacks in the United States. So... This actually will have profoundly negative impacts on uh, our lives, our standing in the world, our ability to have friendly relations with other states. So even if you're looking at this from a purely selfish respect, a perspective, I don't. Uh, you should care about this. Um, I just thought of this because you were talking about the Houthis. You know, given the fact that... Uh, when the U.S. started to mobilize against the Houthis and they, they put forward um, Operation Prosperity Guardian, um, and then when that failed to really demobilize them, they, they started bombing Yemen. You know, given the fact that Canada has supported the U.S. through both of these missions, would you say that this shows that um, the Canadian government prioritizes economy much more than overseas, li overseas lives? Uh, well, I, I don't think that they may think that they're prioritizing the economy over uh, the lives of people in distant lands. Uh, but for the reasons I've just articulated, I don't think this is an economically sensible approach uh, to dealing with the, the war in Gaza. I mean, if you're trying to be just, uh, you know, uh, sensible from a financial or fiscal perspective, uh, you would 
try to de-escalate that conflict as quickly as possible before we get a full-blown war, uh, restoring mar maritime shipping. Also, it costs Canada significant amounts of money to maintain a military presence in the Middle East. That's money we could be using here at home. Uh, even if even if the only thing you care about is the debt, we could be using that money to pay down our debt, but we could also be using it to help with the homeless, the poor, strengthen our health care system and so forth. So from an economic perspective, this makes absolutely no sense. The government may think that this is the economically sensible thing to do, but they're terribly mistaken if that's what they think. I, I believe that the answer is much uh, more sinister, actually. I think they're doing it because this is what the U.S. government wants us to do, principally. And the U.S. government wants us to do this, not because it's serving the interests of the American people, but because it's been completely co-opted by the military industrial complex uh, in the arms industry, uh, just as, you know, uh, President Eisenhower predicted would happen at the end of his second term. Would you say that this really critiques Canada as having a so-called peacekeeper status? That's always been a myth. Canada is a very, very militaristic country. Uh, you know, we, we, we participated in the destruction of Libya. We participated in the 20-year war in Afghanistan, the most, one of the most corrupt wars of our lifetimes, which accomplished nothing, really. Uh, the Taliban are back in power. Huge numbers of lives were lost. Enormous amounts of money were squandered. Uh, we participated in the Iraq war, even though Jean Chrétien did not officially uh, enlist us in that enterprise, which was a, a, a crime against humanity, we were assisting uh, covertly in a number of ways, as was later uh, revealed. Uh, and I could go on and on. Uh, Canada is a highly militaristic country, and we're becoming increasingly militaristic uh, as we, uh, you know, toe the line that Washington asks us to toe. Uh, so it's time for us to face the fact that we are not promoters of peace. Never have been. Uh, but we have the potential to become that. And if we do, it'll be better for us all. Thank you. Um, what do you think of Trudeau calling for a ceasefire weeks ago? Uh, it, it certainly was better than him not calling for a ceasefire. But uh, Israel did precisely, precisely what you know anybody could have predicted. It thumbed its nose at the General Assembly. And if you're not prepared to back up that vote with concrete action then it's pointless. Uh, and what are the concrete actions? Sanctions. Sanctions. Exactly what they've done to Russia, what they've done to Iran, what they did to Venezuela, even though, uh, frankly, none of these countries, none of these countries has engaged in the level of depravity and monstrosity that we're witnessing today in Gaza. So just take, let's take the example of uh, uh, the Ukraine war. Uh, in some two years, it's been almost two years, less than 600 children have been killed. Not all of them were killed by Russian forces, by the way, because the Ukrainians also fired a huge amount of munitions, and some of those munitions uh, did kill civilians. Uh, but let's suppose that all of the civilian, uh, the, the, the children deaths are attributable to Russia. That's fewer than 600 in two years. Over 12,000 have been killed by Israel in Gaza in three months. That's the rate at which... Uh, they are killing children in Gaza is, I did the math, it's about 133 times greater than the rate at which children are dying in the Ukraine war. And yet we have not imposed a single sanction on Israel, but have imposed a broad array of sanctions on Russia. We've sanctioned virtually everything we can sanction when it comes to Russia. So what's the point of voting if you're not going to back it up when Israel thumbs your no its, its nose at you? You know, it has to, we have to enforce the law. Uh, and sanctions are the best way to go about that. After pulling out of the Green Party leadership in 2022, you said those who dare to oppose Western militarism or our failed economic system are being marginalized and suppressed to a degree that is unprecedented in my lifetime. Do you feel that we're seeing this at an intensified rate in Canada during the war on Gaza? Absolutely. I, I've never seen anything like it. Uh, you know, I've been doing uh, pro bono legal work for Palestinian solidarity activists for six years. And uh, in the time, uh, in the three months that have elapsed uh, since this genocidal war began, I have been inundated with requests for legal assistance from people across the country. Uh, some of them, uh, attempts are being made to university students, attempts are being made to expel them from university. Others have lost their jobs. Others are under threat 
of losing their jobs. Uh, one person I'm representing uh, is a professional, uh, and he uh, has had a complaint filed against him, a totally bogus complaint uh, uh, with the professional organization of which he is a part. He could lose his license to practice his chosen profession, which would have devastating consequences on him. And, and, and this particular individual, uh, I'm not going to mention his name, but he, he, his family in Gaza who have been killed in the last three months in the most brutal, horrific manner. And, uh, you know, a major pro-Israel organization here is trying to destroy his career because he spoke out about this. I've never seen anything like it. And today, it's timely that you ask me this question. You know, when Justin Trudeau invoked the Emergencies Act during the truckers' convoy, and I certainly was no fan of that uh, protest myself, I condemned the invocation of the Emergencies Act. Uh, I, I said that it was a violation of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and that this was going to come back and haunt us, that this was setting a precedent. And in fact, today, a court ruled that the invocation of the Emergencies Act violated the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Now, uh, as of this moment, Justin Trudeau hasn't invoked the Emergencies Act against us, in other words, Palestinian solidarity activists. And now that this decision has come out, uh, hopefully he wouldn't think seriously about doing that. Uh, but the precedent has been set. And even though he probably won't end up doing it in this case, I actually have very serious concerns about Pierre Poilievre. If that man, I mean, if we think Justin Trudeau is pro-Israel, wow, that man is like fanatical. And uh, I don't think he would hesitate to use the Emergencies Act to shut down widespread protests against Israel in this country. Uh, so we have we are really in a in a perilous place when it comes to our basic rights of free free speech and free assembly, and it's time that we we stood up for it. And that means we not only defend our own right to speak, but we defend the rights of others to speak, even when we disagree with them. As you know, as I did in the case of the uh, the truckers convoy, I defended their right to protest within reasonable limits, even though I disagreed with their message. Thank you so much. Uh, is there anything that I didn't ask that you want to discuss, Cher? No, that was pretty comprehensive. Okay, wonderful.